Good morning and welcome. It's my pleasure to welcome you today to celebrate the fifth anniversary of the Family First Prevention Services Act. I'm January Contreras, the Assistant Secretary for the Administration for Children and Families, and what a privilege that is. As with many things, today is possible because of the efforts of many. We're joined by federal partners, state, tribal, and territorial leaders, nonprofit and philanthropic friends, providers, health professionals, and the many leaders with lived experience, youth, par parents, caregivers, those who have used their voices along every step of the Family First journey. Thank you for being with us here today in the room. And to all those who have gathered virtually with us, we had more than 500 people register to participate online. So we see you and we thank you. I do love the shorthand name of this legislation, Families First, because that's what this really is about, about putting families at the forefront. Family First is re-envisioning child welfare to prioritize prevention. It's putting resources and support lifelines like mental health services, substance use treatment, and parent support within actual reach of a parent or a caregiver who needs it. It's acknowledging that when we can do it safely, children do better in family care. And that all families should have a fighting chance. Five years ago, Republicans and Democrats, led by members like Senator Wyden and Congressman Davis, came together and created this landmark legislation to help families during some of their most challenging times. ACF is proud to be home base for bringing Family First to life. I especially thank the entire team at our Children's Bureau, at our Administration for Children, Youth, and Families, and for the last five years, this team has been working with states, tribes, and territorial governments to establish prevention plans that serve families all across the country. We know that our ACF family did not do this work alone. We're filled with immense gratitude for everyone who has been a part of this work and for those state tribal, territorial leaders that are joined us today in the room and virtually, we especially thank you for your partnership. We're in dialogue with those leaders every single day, hearing their challenges and their successes. And we will keep moving forward together because we know that right now, there is a family who needs what Family First offers. And we know that for every family who benefits from prevention efforts, there is a child who can sleep safely in their own bed at night. With that, I'd like to call up our leader here at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Secretary Becerra. He has been at the forefront of family well-being for his entire career. He's leading the charge to build access to mental health and behavioral health services for all. And he's someone who, like all of us at ACF and all gathered this morning, believes in leaving no one behind. Please join me in welcoming Secretary Javier Becerra. January, thank you very much. I mean, Assistant Secretary Contreras, thank you very much. <laughs> you forget um, sometimes that we have people at the highest places getting to make some of the biggest decisions who may be the first in their family to get to do these kinds of things. And uh, we should not diminish that a January Contreras is the Assistant Secretary for the Administration of Children and Families. I don't forget it, and that's why she is the Sec Assistant Secretary Contreras for so many of us. I wanna thank you for being part of this. I wanna th thank the folks who are joining us uh, through streaming uh, for being part of this. This is, uh, it's not just a celebration, it's an acknowledgement of what we should have been doing a long time ago. So I'm gonna say a few thank yous first. Uh, I mentioned Assistant Secretary Contreras and the team. Uh, our commissioner, uh, who is sitting right here, Commissioner Gaston, who is 
one of the people who's been doing this for the longest time, and now she's the commissioner. <laughs> if, if I were from New York, I'd say it right, commissioner, however, <laughs> however you would say it in, in New York, but it sounds really good when they say it. Uh, I will also mention that we have a number of folks who will get to be part of a panel, uh, people from all across the country. I wanna mention a few, Justin Brown, the Oklahoma Secretary of Human Services, Vicki Bradley the, uh, from the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indian uh, Nation. Uh, she is with the Secretary of Public Health and Human Services. Robert Matthews, who is the DC Director of Family and Child Services. Brian Samuels, Executive Director of Chapin Hall. Chapin Hall. Uh, Sarah Kastelik, Executive Director of the National Indian Child Welfare Association. And David Hansel, Senior Policy Advisor of the Casey Family Programs. All of them will be part of today's activities to celebrate families first. Uh, and all of them have been doing this for quite some time. And to each and every one of you who have been part of this effort to lift up families, we say thank you. Frederick Douglass probably said it best, at least in my book. And he said it, what, 160 years ago? Uh, easier to build strong children than to repair broken men and men and women. It goes without saying. And too often, even some of our homes seem to be in pain, sometimes broken or breaking up. And the ones who lose most oftentimes are the children. How can it be easier to build strong children if the home isn't in repair and isn't ready to go? And so, we should heed what Frederick Douglass was crying out to say when it was even more painful back in those days, but it still applies today. And we could do that, and we can do it very easily. Because at the end of the day, as we've, we've always heard, it, it takes a village. It takes a team, the way I like to look at it, because at HHS, that's what we are. We are a team to get this done. And what is a team but a greater family? And so it takes a family. And if we don't recognize that, and if we decide to send a child somewhere else to keep them safe, we forget that we have just broken up the best team that that child can hope for. And we have to strive to make that the best team. It may not always be, but our first goal should make it the easiest to build that strong child. And so that's what we're about at HHS. But it doesn't just come easy. It takes some work. Actually, it takes courage. You're gonna hear from some folks who can tell you how it took courage to make some of this happen, to build strong children. Speak to Nikki from the great state of Oklahoma who was struggling with alcohol use. You know, that could easily end a family and break it up. Yet she was able to turn to get some support. And through some of the family first funding that was made available, Nikki got herself clean. She was able to get herself up and get right. And today she will tell you about how it is to be able to build a strong family with her four children. Uh, that is courage. It's not just the funding, it is courage. Speak to Jeff from Kansas, who had a family member who was struggling with drug use and had to figure out a way to keep the family to together. He was able to turn to local support because of Family First, the funding that was made available. And today, that family is together, and you'll probably hear today, I think by video, from Jeff. All of those things make it possible for us to talk about keeping families together, rewarding the courage that goes into this. But at the end of the day, the day when you think about it, if we're keeping a family together, if we're making it easier to build strong children, what we're simply doing is giving you me and the rest of the American family. Peace of mind. Peace of mind to know, as my dad would always tell me, if I can get up in the morning and go to work, it's gonna be a good day. How many families, when they wake up in the morning, don't know what's gonna come next? How can it be a good day for you and for your family, your children, if you don't know what's gonna come next? Peace of mind comes when you know you've got rock solid support and love in your home, in your family. 
And that's what we want to try to build because if we know at the end of the day that if we build a rock solid family, Frederick Douglass already told us we're going to have strong kids. And if we have strong kids, we're going to have strong leaders. And if we have strong leaders, we're going to have a very strong nation. And if you have a strong nation, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, there it is. And so I say to all of you, at the end of the day, how do you spell success in America? It is family. And it is building the family at the core location, and that is at home. And so I think we're here simply to say, Mr. Douglas, we hear you. Maybe a little late, but we hear you. And with champions like Senator Juan, Ron Wyden and Jeff and Nikki and others who are implementing the Family First agenda throughout the country, more than 39 states, many of them have already gotten their plans approved at the federal level. Tens of millions of dollars have already gone out from the federal government to help those states that are willing, willing to have the courage to help people come back, stand up, raise their family. We can get this done. But it does take courage. It does take a family. And it does take champions. And I'd like to now introduce to you a real champion behind those strong families. Someone who probably can echo the words of Frederick Douglass in so many different ways. Uh, a champion for families, a champion for better care, someone who has spent many, many years in the Senate, the U.S. Senate, made it, making it clear that he understands what it means to have success. And so with no further ado, let me introduce the real champion behind the family first legislation that made it possible for us to help Nikki and Jeff and countless more, our senator from Oregon, Ron Wyden. What an inflationary introduction. <laughs> and celebrations are not for filibusters. And just take a minute or two to kind of bring people up to a little bit of the history. This was really the brainchild of Marion Wright Edelman, the legendary founder of the Children's Defense Fund. And I had gotten to know her over the years, really through Ted Kennedy. My background, I was director of the Great Panthers for about seven years before I was elected to Congress, ran the legal aid office for the elderly. And of course, Senator Kennedy had passed and I was a fairly junior member on the Finance Committee when we started talking about this. And when Marion Wright Edelman and I talked about it, I said, Ms. Edelman, the federal government has a policy that incentivizes ripping families apart. I said, this is really weird, even by Washington, D.C. standards. Why would you do? something like that. And so we set out really in that kind of period when Orrin Hatch was the chairman. I was the ranking you know, Democrat. He treated me like his son, prompting my older daughter to say, Dad, you're in the only profession on earth where somebody your age is still considered kind of young. <laughs> <clears throat> but so we went and uh, Secretary Becerra, uh, Assistant Secretary Contreras, Commissioner Jones-Gaston, Associate Commissioner Schomburg. Let's give them all a big round of applause because <laughs> we wrote the bill. But as my friend Secretary Becerra said, we were in the House together. Writing a bill is just the start. You know, you can like get your pen and put on your nice suit and go to a big signing ceremony, but the heavy lifting you know, starts then because as you know, there were a lot of turf battles here. And what we said is, look, right now, too many families have two choices that are not exactly ideal. One is keeping a kid in a home where things aren't going so well. Somebody's got an alcohol challenge, somebody got a drug challenge. Hard to line up kinship, you know, care. 
when I was a really young congressman, had a full head of hair and rugged good looks. <laughs> I was the author of the kinship care program. I'm not even sure the secretary knows the story, but Bill Clinton wanted my vote on NAFTA, North American Free Trade Agreement, big, difficult vote. And I said, so, Mr. President, um, there's something I'm interested in. And I was interested in it from my days with the elderly because the elderly love those whole kinship kind of services. <clears throat> and he said, yeah, everybody's asking for stuff. And I said, I want to start kinship care. I want to kick it off at least to remove the bias against kinship care, which is what you had then. He looked at me and he goes, I knew you'd ask me for something good. <laughs> and we got it. And every year this has been about kind of filling in the, you know, the next steps and, uh, and families first was probably the third and fourth iteration of constantly making it easier to get kinship care placements and have resources and the like. And a lot of times everybody was hanging crepe, didn't think it would happen. Some of you may have seen the story where I was on the floor in front of the Congress before we got it passed and no senator would object to what we were doing. They wouldn't object in public, but they kept sending people out. It was four o'clock in the morning and I had a wonderful staff person. Uh, some of you may remember Laura Bernson, who is one of the real heroines in this. And she was off in the corner sobbing as where Warren Hatch's people, because nobody had the guts to go, come up and say, well, we're standing up for a state that just has foster care facilities and they don't want it. And foster care was, of course, the option of default. And look, there are good foster care facilities, period, full stop. There are lots of them that aren't so good. And so we wanted kind of choices. So. 2016 didn't really look possible. 2018, we had done a lot of work with um, groups that I'm sure that you all um, were strongly involved with, and we thought we could, you know, make this, you know, happen. And we just broke it down so that, and I was, uh, Becca in our office is terrific, and she must be out there watching. And I said, let's say this really simply. I said, give families a chance to stay together. That's what Families First is all about. It's not always doable. We can sure do a better job than we're um, doing. And uh, Families First basically did more to empower kinship caregivers, did more to make sure that the dollars were there for the services um, for the families. We're happy to see the Children's Bureau build on the work by issuing the new draft guidance. That's going to be very good, very good again for kinship care. Uh, Families First is also helping youth intensive residential treatment. That's a big deal, behavioral health. And I'm going to have to zip in a minute, but you watch us go with behavioral health this time. Um, Senator Crapo and I got six mental health provisions in the gun safety bill here in the last Congress. You know, it was largely Medicaid and watch where we go on Medicaid for the future. In the last Congress, I was able to get the CAHOOTS program. I don't know if you've heard of that, but it's the mental health and the law enforcement folks you know, working together. You got a billion dollars um, for it. But Medicaid can do even more in the future. And as long as I'm chairman of the Finance Committee, we're gonna find ways to do that. And right now, um, there's a model behavioral health program put together by Steve and Connie Balmer. He's the former Microsoft person, basketball owner. I'm partial to basketball players since I went to school on a scholarship. It's another story, dream, <laughs> dreaming of playing in the NBA, pretty ridiculous. Um, but it's an exciting time. This is an exciting time for people who are on the front lines of innovating in social policy. And at the end of the day, that's really what this opportunity is all about, is to have ideas-driven, innovation-driven kind of uh, policies that really overhaul child welfare. And we've made a lot of good changes. We got a lot more uh, to do. First question I asked, where's Ms. Gaston floating around somewhere? Um, there, 
oh, there she is in the front row. I said, how's it going in LA? <laughs> because LA was one of our biggest challenges where the foster care facilities were you know, particularly strong. But we got there, we got there. And there's a lot more to do. And so enjoy this kind of period. Um, we wouldn't have given up Ms. Gaston because we had her in Oregon for three years for very many reasons. But the chance to have her showcase all that she has learned over the years, I think is just a great service um, to the country. So uh, my message is uh, enjoy today. There are a number of you that uh, I had met along the way in these kind of battles, but you know, our door is open. Sean Bishop is the finance you know, director and very, very skilled and very much committed to these issues. And uh, let's just operate on the, the assumption, uh, this is not an official finance committee you know, kind of proceeding, but I'm gonna mo have a motion now that our conversation about new ideas and building on Families First be continued I hear no motion in opposition. <laughs> it's so pa it's so passed. God bless. Keep up the good work. Thanks, everybody. My name is Danny Davis, and I'm honored to be one of the Democratic leaders of the Family First Prevention Services Act. I want to thank Secretary Becerra and Assistant Secretary Contreras for the opportunity to give remarks in celebration of the fifth anniversary of this landmark law. I apologize that I cannot be there with you in person, but I came to Congress to help people. My congressional district historically has one of the highest percentages of children living with grandparent caregivers in the nation. And so I see the needs of my communities each and every day. When I ask foster youth what policymakers can do to help them, they almost always say, you could have helped my mom or you could have helped my dad. I am proud of Family First because it did exactly what the foster youth asked. It addresses key reasons that families struggle to keep children safe and out of the child welfare system. I am proud that Family First is in line and in law because of the commitment and vision of both Democratic and Republican lawmakers who know that our country is stronger when we strengthen families. I recognize that Congress just passed the law, but it is the advocates, foster youth yourselves, state and federal leaders who are making the law a reality. I also know that it is important to take opportunities like today to recognize the significance of this law and the legacy of thriving children that its implementation can spur. I thank you so much and have a wonderful day. Our huge thanks to our leader here, Secretary Becerra, also to Senator Wyden and Congressman Davis, who have in fact been champions alongside other Democratic and Republican leaders in our Congress. So this is all about bipartisan support, and it's one of the things that where we do see the values of this country being centered on families. We have a, a video. Of course, we wanted to bring voices of people with lived experience in the room and had some um, families share their stories with us in order to share with you about what prevention services have meant to them uh, funded through Family First. And then we have two panels that we look forward to moving to afterward to talk about the way forward. Uh, so we'll have the videos now. Thank you. I don't know who I would be without child and family services. I was 17 
And I found out that I was going to be a mom. So I had just graduated from high school, about to leave for college. Like, I had everything planned ahead of me. And then that's when I found out I was having twins. So two, not one child, but two. I was scared. Hi, I'm Ashanti. I'm a mom of twin girls, and I live in Washington, D.C. The services that has been helpful to me as far as being a mom was the Mary Elizabeth House, me and the other teen moms that are here. They would give us advice and things that we should know how to become a better mom. And sit down and play with the toys. We have groups throughout the week talk about stress, depression, so it has helped me open up more and help me become myself as far as like being independent. I see a baby. Being a mom is stressful, but in the end it's worth it. I've got 10 toes and I feel as though being a team mom, you can still be successful. Because I am. And I went to nursing school when I was pregnant, graduated from the nursing program, and I also just recently graduated from my ENT program. We learned about basically being a first responder, as in 911, so helping patients, and that's something that I love to do. I love helping people. JJ? I love being a mom. Mm. JJ? Like my kids, they bring me peace and keep me sane. My kids are the reason why I keep going and keep striving. They play a big part in me being successful. Pie. Child and family services help me become a better mom, a better student, a better me. My name is Jeff. I live in Kansas. My son, Adam, who is two years old, he's just a normal little kid. He likes to play and watch cartoons on TV. My situation in, involved his mom. She had an addiction problem. Of course, it really affected us a lot. It affected Adam's growth and development, I think. And it was a toxic environment for both of us. Yeah, it was, it was really bad, and healthy families helped me out a lot. I don't know where I'd be without them, honestly. They would come out each week and visit with us and, and work with Adam and to help with his development, and they would come see me, make sure Dad's doing okay. And so, yeah, now that the substance abuse is out of the home, you know, things have really gotten a lot better. It just, Adam's just doing really good here. And I have a good routine with Adam. I hope they continue to fund the, the services that I received, you know, because it really, it really is a good thing. It's money well spent. And I, I just hope they keep doing it because it helps so many families. I don't know what I would do without Adam. I mean, you know, he's my life. You know, he's got an awesome smile and an awesome laugh. Um, I'm just so glad and to be his dad and, yeah, blessed to have him in my life. We'll get ready to get the panel set up. So, um, I will just mention, of course, Family First services are also available to pregnant and parenting teens. And I did have the opportunity with Associate Commissioner Schomburg to meet Ashanti in person. Uh, I have a feeling she's going to be on this stage at, at some point. <laughs> So we'll get ready for our first panel because what we want to do is not only celebrate or recognize the five year anniversary of this landmark piece of legislation, but we also want to talk about what has the experience been like up to now? What does it look like moving forward? Recognizing, you know, when we're meeting with leaders on the ground implementing, we're hearing about successes and we're hearing about challenges. 
And so we want to make sure that we're having dialogue at the same time that we're having this gathering. So our first panel includes our own um, as moderator, Associate Commissioner of the Children's Bureau, Asia Schomburg, and we're joined by Brian Samuels from Chapin Hall and David Hansel from Casey Family Programs. And I believe Sarah Kostelik is joining us uh, virtually. So Brian is from Chapin Hall, David Hansel from Casey Family Programs, and Sarah from the National Indian Child Welfare Association. Can we confirm that um, Sarah is on? Good morning, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Sarah. Um, welcome, welcome. So let's get started because we have a, a, a limited amount of time. Oh, there you are. Limited amount of time um, for our panel. But today we celebrate five years of Family First. How has the Family First impacted children and families involved in the child welfare system over the past five years? Who wants to start? David? Um, so uh, good to see everybody. Um, you know, I think. Uh, the greatest impact Family First has had is really on uh, states being able to rethink the front end of the system. You know, for the better part of the 90s and 2000s, much of federal policy focused on reducing the number of children in care by getting folks out, um, and then a focus on making sure that kids were safe when they were in foster care. Um, but states were left then to design the front end of the system themselves. And as many of you know, um, that's where all of the risky decisions get made. So whether to take a child into care or not um, uh, primarily is a state decision. Uh, and often it was the case that those uh, end up being very um, politically sensitive decisions also. Uh, I remember uh, uh, every day uh, when I was a child welfare director, at the end of the day, I finished my day by reading morning reports. And morning reports are where anything that the field thought might be in the morning's paper. Uh, and in almost every instance, uh, um, the first thing I would do uh, when I got this list of stories to read was to first scan them to try to figure out prior contact. I wanted to know how often it was the case that uh, we um, intervened in a family but decided not to remove the child, right? And so that was a state decision. I had to own that decision. And Family First brings the federal government into that decision. It brings resources into that decision. It gives states permission uh, to really rethink the front end of the system. And I think in doing that, um, get much better um, at dividing out those families that really do need the attention of uh, out-of-home care um, because of the level of risk, uh, and those families that would benefit from not entering the system at all. So uh, giving, fed giving states the flexibility as well as the validation uh, to reform the front end of the system, I think, uh, um, is, will be a part of the legacy um, of this particular act. Thank you, Brian. David? Well, first of all, amen to everything that Brian just said. And, uh, and I'm really thrilled to be here, uh, not just to be with wonderful friends and colleagues, um, but because I really do think that um, Family First is a tremendously um, important change. Um, you know, it's not often that Congress creates a new open-ended funding stream, essentially an entitlement, which is really what Family First is. Um, and for Congress to create one that's focused on keeping children safely at home, keeping families together, preventing maltreatment, not just responding to maltreatment, and keeping kids out of foster care is really, I think, a very significant statement about federal priorities. Um, President Biden once said, uh, show me your budget, and I'll tell you what you value. And for decades, uh, and, and Senator Wyden really just said this, for decades, uh, the main federal funding stream for child welfare basically provided money to states to place children in foster care and to keep them there. And now that same funding stream, Title IV-E, provides funding to states to keep children out of foster care. That's a, truly a sea change. Um, so I think it's really important, um, it's wonderful, uh, that almost every state has now submitted a prevention plan and a number of tribes as well. Most of those have been approved. Um, there's a lot of implementation work still to do, um, for sure, but it's really great. And I really think Family First has led to a rethinking across the country about what child welfare should be and about how child welfare agencies should interact with children and families. Thank you, David. And Sarah, what's your, what are your thoughts on the impact of Family First? 
Well, Chamai, good morning. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be with you today. Um, really appreciate this chance to visit with HHS leadership and so many colleagues here in the audience. Um, I want to talk just for a second about some of the opening remarks this morning. So Secretary Bracera said, prevention is something that we should have been doing a long time ago. Uh, and I just want to note that American Indian and Alaska Native tribal communities did traditionally prioritize prevention, that there's a safety net that's encoded in our practices, our traditional practices, in our language, in our extended family network. Um, so we really have a lot to draw on when we're talking about prevention here. Senator Wyden acknowledged that um, at every step, we're filling in um, the next steps incrementally. So we have a policy framework and there's more opportunity, more that we can do to continue to improve uh, this framework to give families a chance to stay together. So when I think about uh, the impact of this landmark legislation, um, I think about how American Indian and Alaska Native tribes and Native peoples um, are uh, experiencing this program in actually two different ways. So there was mention already of tribes who receive Title IV-E directly and who have the opportunity to uh, develop their own plan for prevention services. Uh, so four tribes have submitted those plans, three of them have been approved, but there are uh, 576 federally recognized tribes in this country. So there are a significant number of tribes um, who are not able to access this uh, program directly. Uh, there are over 100 tribes that have Title IV-E agreements uh, with their state, um, and those uh, those tribes are experiencing this program in a different way. So they're, they're limited to what their state plan um, is approved to do. So I, I know we'll get into this in a little bit more detail soon. We have more opportunity to talk about this, but just want to lift up uh, that tribes are differentially impacted, Native people are differentially impacted uh, by some of the, the framework that we have in place. And I think there's a lot of opportunity uh, to continue to improve it, as Senator Wyden noted. Thank you, Sarah. And always important to think about how tribes uh, may be experiencing family first as well, separate and apart from um, um, other 4E agencies. Um, so what are some of the most interesting trends that you have seen uh, across jurisdictions? I want to start with David. Oh, thank you. Um, well, great question. Um, there are many. Um, and what's actually really great is to see that states are continuing to think more broadly about what they can do with Family First, what, what families they can serve and what programs they can put in place. So it's a continuing process. But um, I think there are, there are three that I would mention that I think are, are particularly interesting. Um, one is um, we're seeing uh, a number of states implement and more and more states think about implementing um, what uh, have been come to be called community pathways to services. That is making sure that families can access services in their communities through whatever service pathway works for them without any involvement with the child welfare system at all, and really to, hope to prevent that kind of involvement. So I think that's one very interesting trend that we're seeing uh, across the country. Um, second one is uh, more states thinking um, very specifically about uh, groups of families that have particular challenges and vulnerabilities that may predispose them to be more involved in the child welfare system. I give the example, for example, of, of uh, families who are experiencing homelessness who uh, are usually also experiencing other challenges in their lives, and again, may be more likely than other families to, uh, to end up having child welfare system involvement. And so focusing on families like that, getting them services early when they need them, both to address the challenges they're facing, but also with the goal of keeping them out of the child welfare system and, and out of that kind of involvement, I think is a second um, very interesting trend. And the third I would mention, Asia, is um, states are more and more, I think, thinking about Family First not just in isolation as a funding stream, but in tandem with other funding streams mm -hmm. and sort of thinking about how they can use funding, you know, uh, what we typically call blending and braiding funding streams to create more comprehensive service systems. And I would give the example of newborn home visiting, for example, you know, making sure that new parents have the support they need to adjust to having a new, a new child, new infant in the home. Mm -hmm. Family First now has several programs in the clearinghouse that support newborn home visiting. Medicaid also supports newborn home visiting. And SAMHSA, through its uh, maternal, infant, and early childhood home visiting program, the McVee program, 
also supports home visiting programs. So we're seeing, I think, more and more states think creatively about integrating all of those funding streams, including Family First, to create more comprehensive, or even in some cases, as I think in New Jersey, universal home visiting programs um, that will reach all families. So I think there's a lot of really exciting work happening. Thank you, David. Sarah, I wanna go to you. Thank you. Um, so I do think there are a lot of interesting things that we're seeing now. Um, I would I would wanna lift up um, the fact that, so we know that 60% of Native uh, children who are involved in the child welfare system are in state programs, not tribal programs. So there's a real big opportunity here for, uh, for states to serve families with culturally appropriate services. So um, a really interesting trend is that we've seen a number of states uh, child welfare agencies, universities who are working with tribal communities to identify culturally appropriate uh, prevention programs and services, and then to try to build an evidence base around it. So we know that historically, uh, research funding, uh, program funding has not been used to support, to document uh, these kind of programs. And so there's a real opportunity here for some new partnerships uh, that approach uh, building this evidence base in a, in a way that honors tribal sovereignty, honors tribal ownership of data. Uh, and so there's some great collaborations that are happening. I would mention Washington State as one state that comes to mind here, but there are other states that are doing this as well. So these collaborations are really identifying tribal programs, uh, looking at additional data or um, studies that need to happen uh, to be able to build this evidence base more robustly so that uh, some of these programs and services can at least qualify at the promising practice level. Uh, so this is a really important first step in acknowledging that more needs to be done to identify, to document, and to include tribally-based prevention programs in the clearinghouse. Uh, right now, there's only one program in the clearinghouse that I'm aware of that is a culturally specific program for Native communities. It's the Native Spirit Program. Uh, home visiting program, so wonderful that we've got one program there, but uh, there's a whole lot more that we can do, uh, and we need to be taking another look at adaptation or more specifically cultural adaptation of other programs and services that um, are already in the clearinghouse. So I think there's a lot more work here. Thank you, Brian, your thoughts? Sure, um, so th the only thing I, I would add to the uh, comments um, that uh, just preceded me um, is this idea that uh, in some respects, um, states are seeing Family First um, as addition, as a way of subtracting the role of child welfare where, where it's unnecessary, right? So um, states are really trying to figure out, are there ways of building partnerships out in front of the system before families become into contact with the child welfare system. And in doing that, being able to reach out further and build partnerships with uh, communities and other state agencies, um, they're actually able to reduce the footprint that child welfare sits in, right? So a lot of folks see um, child welfare as the last resort. Um, child welfare often feels like um, it's responsible for all of the other policies that don't quite work right uh, um, upstream. Uh, but these funds have allowed child welfare to begin to imagine um, uh, partnering with others in ways that shrink the footprint um, by really being able to address families and their needs much earlier um, than when they show up at the child welfare system. And so in that way, it repositions the child welfare agency as not the entity that's responsible for all bad things that might happen to kids and families, but really um, put itself in a unique position to um, uh, address a smaller set of families and a smaller set of needs by really creating an avenue, creating a space where there are lots of other folks with resources intervening earlier. And I think what's really exciting about the Family First uh, in thinking about the earlier uh, ways of engaging families is rethinking the way all of the ACF programs might be seen um, as prevention oriented for um, child welfare, right? It's not just the CBCAP money um, for prevention or other small pots of federal support. Um, but states are beginning to imagine how all of the ACF programs uh, can individually and collectively uh, begin to build a much stronger uh, platform for families to be successful. Um, and in doing that, again, shrink the place that child welfare sits 
um, because the, we've got partners and other resources stepping into that space um, earlier when families uh, can benefit from services. Oh, thank you, Brian. And you're actually a perfect segue to our next question because you're talking about a vision for family first. And you know what I heard you say is like child welfare as like a last resort. And you and I have talked about that before. But what do you? How do you see family first evolving over the next five years? Sure. So I, th I think um, like. Um, uh, back in the 90s when the Adoptions and Safe Families Act was passed uh, and it set specific timelines uh, for um, states being able to move families through and out of the system, right? Um, the day that that legislation was passed, um, uh, folks couldn't imagine how permanency could be achieved uh, um, for uh, many of the families in the child welfare system, um, but across time, States developed methodologies, state developed practices, they became more sophisticated in targeting different resources to different families. And in doing that, they increased the rate at which they were moving families to permanency. And they, were, and they got better at um, addressing the needs of subpopulations of young people um, who may be moving through the system slower or not getting back home as quickly as they can. So I think one of the major steps forward, uh, um, the vision of the future, um, is an increasingly more sophisticated strategy, right? One, one that builds on partnerships and infrastructure that exist in communities to be able to put resources in places where other community-based agencies can contribute their part to it. Um, so I, I think what we see today uh, it is analogous to what you saw in the first five years um, of a focus on permanency. But if you look up today, states are so much more sophisticated in how they bring all of that together in one place to effectively uh, produce the results. And I imagine uh, that across time, uh, uh, that state agencies uh, uh, and communities will develop much more sophisticated approaches to the way in which they identify families, they get to them earlier, they give them the right services when they need them, and they produce the desired result, which again shrinks the, the footprint uh, for child welfare. So I think there'll be greater sophistication as they move forward and blend and integrate in ways uh, that create a unique uh, um, service system um, across communities uh, so that you're addressing the needs uh, as early and as appropriately as possible. So that f sophistication, I think, will be critical moving forward. Thank you, Brian. And David, what do you see as the impact of Family First, how it might evolve over, over the next five years? Well, you know, I, I talked a little earlier about uh, Family First as a new entitlement funding stream, um, which it is, and um, those don't get implemented overnight. <laughs> it's a big change. Uh, you know, if you look at if you look at the Medicaid program, for mm -hmm. example, as another uh, example, Medicaid was enacted in 1965. The last state that opted into Medicaid, Arizona, did it in 1982, 17 years later, and then of course Medicaid has continued to expand over the years since then. Um, so it's been a process, and I'm sure Family First is going to be a process. Um, but I think we need to stay focused on where we're trying to get. We do need to acknowledge, I think, that there is still a lot of implementation work to be done around mm -hmm. Family First. It's great that most states now have approved plans, prevention plans, um, but we also know that states are facing challenges in getting their new prevention programs up and running, in putting the mechanism in place to be able to actually draw down the federal funding, which is really what's going to make the program sustainable over the long term. So we have a lot of work to do uh, just to get uh, programs up and running, which is really important. But I think we should also uh, stay focused on our vision for what Family First could be. Mm -hmm. And what I would posit as, as a kind of a North Star is to try to get to the point as soon as we can where the lines on the graph cross and where states are drawing down more, fam more 4E funding mm -hmm. for prevention mm -hmm. than they are for foster care. That's not going to happen tomorrow. It's going to take some time, but it can be done. And I know it can be done because in New York City, Asia, where you and I worked together, where I was the commissioner for five years, we reached a milestone like that some years ago where we were serving more children in prevention programs than in foster care. So I think we should stay focused on a goal like that. I would suggest that one. Um, and then to get there, I think it's going to be very important that states and, and the Children's Bureau continue to think um, innovatively about the expanding the families that can be served through Family First and the kinds of programs that will really address their needs, um, help keep them stable, help keep children safe and, and, and support their well-being, and keep children out of foster care and out of the child welfare system. 
Thank you, David. And, and to your point around a lot of work to be done, we recognize that too also <laughs> at, the, at, the, at the federal level. We're really building our team um, and, you know, um, to be able to help with implementation and we're mm. doing some reconnaissance in that area of trying to figure out from jurisdictions what they really need to implement and how we can be helpful. And of course, you've mentioned uh, New York City, so I have to say shout out to Luis Linares, who is one of our expert consultants on prevention, but also helped us in New York City get toward uh, to be in a place where we are uh, we're, um, allocating our resources for prevention and, and mm -hmm. more over foster care. So mm -hmm. thanks for mentioning that. Mm -hmm. And now, Sarah, what are you thinking? What are your thoughts around um, evolution for the next five years? Well, I love these visions that we're hearing um, from my, my colleagues here. Um, I think one thing I want to point out is that I, I think the trajectory for Native families and children in particular will be dependent on how much family first can accommodate culturally based programs and services. So we hear consistently from uh, elected and appointed tribal leaders, from tribal child welfare directors across the country about um, how important flexibility is in being able to uh, uh, use these programs and services, culturally based uh, programs and services to support families and kids. And we know these services make a difference. So when we look at tribes uh, across the country who've, who've been able to do this, you know, some of the language that we use is, is around decolonization of tribal programs. So when tribes are uh, looking back to their cultural foundation, looking back to their uh, teachings and values and thinking about those things in uh, and contemporary practice, um, really being able to move away from programs and services that mirror state uh, programs that uh, frankly have never served Native families well, uh, but be able to re reinvent those services and programs uh, to be able to um, recognize much further upstream when families are struggling, uh, not to wait for bumps and bruises or abandonment uh, to offer services and supports, but to wrap those around families so kids can stay safely at home. There's a real opportunity here to interrupt the transmission of adverse childhood experiences from one generation to the next uh, through many of the things that families experience uh, related to the child welfare system and actually to create within child welfare an opportunity for family healing. So I think there's really a lot of promise here. Thanks, Sarah. And so um, just as a reminder to our audience, you are the executive direc director of the National Indian Child Welfare Association. So when you think specifically about your organization, what is one innovation or mm. out of the box idea um, that you have um, for how you might, um, you know, um, innovate and in, I think in this space with Family First? Yeah, I, I think there are two things that I would point to. One is um, really expanding the boundaries of cultural adaptation so that states and tribes have some more latitude for developing these cultural adaptations of mainstream models. Um, I'd mentioned earlier just the, the dearth of research um, that supports many of these practices. And so uh, really being able to um, recognize the disadvantage that tribal communities are at without this uh, evidence base around culturally adapted services and uh, being able to consider uh, research design, thinking about uh, frameworks for research that are uh, community engaged, that acknowledge tribal sovereignty and ownership of data, uh, that reconsider what constitutes quote unquote evidence. I think there's uh, a lot of room here to think about things like practice-based evidence, for example. And then I think one of the things that can make the biggest difference of all really is uh, to provide tribal nations that have Title IV-E agreements, so more than 100 tribes that have Title IV-E agreements with their states, to give them the same flexibility to develop those culturally-based programs and services as direct-funded Title IV-E nations. And so that's not really an out-of-the-box idea. In fact, the Biden administration requested this policy change in their FY23 budgets. They've already asked Congress to do this, but it hasn't been enacted into law yet. So just felt like that's a real low hanging fruit that we can call on our champions in Congress to help us out with. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and Brian, what about Chapin Hall? Sure. So I, I think one of the um, really uh, unique opportunities that exist today is the convergence of a number of public systems towards the recognition that families are best served in communities. 
And so one of the things that I think uh, is really important is to begin to really articulate what the infrastructure of communities need to look like in order for families to be appropriately supported in those communities, right? So you've got not just child welfare moving towards a more community-based approach to prevention, but you also have the juvenile justice system that's talking about a prevention-oriented, community-based set of interventions and supports for young people so that they don't come to the attention of the child welfare system, right? You've got the public health community that is trying to grow the infrastructure, right? So you've got these public systems that are all recognizing that communities ought to be um, the fundamental foundation upon which families uh, um, build uh, sustainable, meaningful, positive outcomes for kids and their families. Um, and yet, uh, um, there hasn't been a convergence across these systems to really think about what investments need to be made to ensure that there's the infrastructure in communities to achieve the kind of prevention-oriented systems folks would like to see. And so I would imagine that bringing those various systems together and envisioning around what that infrastructure looks like, who needs to be there, what's the fo workforce look like from within those communities, I think can be a really powerful movement towards realizing the, the larger vision that Senator Wyden talked about uh, when he described um, the conversations that he began uh, with Marion Wright Edelman. Thanks, and David Casey, what, any, any, any out of the box Ideas. Can I cheat and mention two? <laughs> <laughs> I think so. I think I'm, I'm good on time. Okay, so great. <laughs> so I will, I will mention two that I think are really exciting. One is, and, and the first one, I really have to credit Brian and Chapin Hall because they've been in the lead on this. Um, and that is building on the growing body of evidence that economic stability is really critical to keeping children safe preventing maltreatment, and reducing families' involvement in the child welfare system. We learned a lot about that during the pandemic when there were new programs, and to everybody's amazement, we didn't see maltreatment um, explode, which many people thought we would. And I think uh, research is beginning to show that that has a lot to do with the fact that there were pandemic-related economic um, supports that were built in for families. So I think that's one, is how do we use that information to think about how we can expand what's available through Family First to Families to include programs that will support economic and concrete support access for families. Um, I think that's very important. The other one is to begin reaching beyond the professional child welfare community, um, beyond the academics and the researchers who uh, develop programs, evaluate programs, get programs sort of teed up for the clearinghouse, and to really reach out to the children and the families who are affected by the child welfare system, who have lived experience, and to ask them what services they need, what services would really support them and help keep them out of child welfare involvement and keep kids out of foster care. Um, I think we have to be more expansive about the outreach we're doing to understand what programs really make a difference for children and families, and then to focus on those programs to get them through the evaluation process so they can get into the clearinghouse and become available for states um, to implement using family first funding. I appreciate you mentioning that. And um, because when you think about expansive and, and um, having proximity with lived experience, taking into account those with lived experience, um, I think it's really important. I'm so glad, Sarah, that you're here, that we are, you know, we keep it on the front burner, right? You know, how are we, you know, impacting the families that we're supposed to serve? Um, so I want to dig in a little bit uh, with um, Native families, um, you know, and I'll start with you, Sarah, um, but what are your thoughts on how Family First has benefited um, Native American families um, and, and tribes? Well, I think at this stage, um, the benefit has been pretty minimal. So we talked about the very small number of tribes that actually have plans that have uh, been approved. And, um, you know, many states have plans that have uh, just a few uh, evidence-based programs and services that are uh, available, and many of those uh, are not culturally specific. So. I think this is, uh, this is a place where we're waiting to see what happens. This is a place where uh, there's lots of room for policy change, for tweaks uh, that can really help to bring the vision that we're, we're outlining here, uh, make that a reality for families, uh, Native families in particular. So I think there's 
uh, been just minimal impact so far and lots of opportunity for much more to do in this space. Yeah, thank you for your honesty about that. Lots of work to do there. Um, Brian, what do you think? Um, so so I, I think uh, what's really powerful uh, um, around, child, around child welfare and family first uh, and tribes um, is, is it presented another opportunity to bring to the table together as equals uh, tribes uh, and state agencies, really to create a conversation in which uh, you're also bringing resources to the table to discuss the best way to allocate those resources, the best way to access those resources. So, you know, whereas um, uh, it is often the case that you can get stuck in places uh, around uh, tribes and child welfare, uh, that you take positions that harden across time and there isn't the flexibility. And so introducing Family First into the conversation, I think, has created a, a new conversation that states and tribes can have together about much more appropriate responses. Uh, admittedly, um, lots of challenges in the clearinghouse uh, related to this space, um, but it, it, it does create a very unique uh, opportunity um, nobody's got an advantage on Family First or all figuring this out at the same time. And so to have tribes at the table engaging these, in these conversations in a very developmental way uh, um, at the same time as states are doing it, um, that, that work in concert uh, I think is really powerful and I think is representative of the kind of relationships um, states and tribes uh, um, aspire. Well, first of all, let me say, Sarah is much more an authority on uh, Indian child welfare than I am, so uh, I really respect uh, her perspective and, and, and agree with it. Um, I guess what I would say is, you know, we, we've long recognized in this country that we need to respond, and child welfare agencies need to respond to the needs of uh, tribal children and families differently from other families, and that's because we respect tribal sovereignty, um, we think it's important to respond in ways that are consistent with tribal culture um, and because there's a need to maintain tribal connections and relationships for children with their, with their, their tribal communities. So, you know, we've long done things differently. That's why we've had the Indian Child Welfare Act for, you know, 40-some years. So I think that's, you know, that's um, kind of the aspirational goal of Family First, where we want to try to get is, is to really replicate that in Family First. Um, it's great that there are several tribes that have implemented programs of the, the, the handful of tribes that have direct relationships with the federal government. But the vast majority of tribes don't. They operate either uh, through relationship with their states or they're dependent on their states to provide child welfare services. So we've got to make sure we extend that framework um, to all tribes and, and children and families in those tribes. And so I think, as Brian said, uh, what Family First has done, I think, is reinvigorate um, discussions between states and tribes about how they can work together to best serve tribal children and families. Yeah. Those conversations haven't always been easy, <laughs> and they have a long way to go, but I think they're really important, and I think that really is, is the framework that Family First has created. Great. Thank you. I had another question here just around deference to um, tribal sovereignty and culture. Um, and then I know, you know, Sarah, you've certainly spoken to it, but I want to give any of you an opportunity to, to say a little bit more about that, um, if you'd like, before we go to closing remarks. Uh, would just really second the remarks just made about the importance of tribal state relationships and the ability of tribes and states to talk together about what's going to work best for this population, for Native kids and families. Um, we know that uh, local solutions are best and tribal populations are diverse uh, across the country. And so um, those conversations uh, with tribes at the table talking about what's best needed for their population are, are really important. Um, and, you know, despite the fact that uh, that a number of tribes are able to uh, s develop these programs and services themselves, we know that there will be many tribes uh, who do not. And so uh, we need state plans. We need state services and programs that work for Native families um, in as much as we, uh, we really hope that tribes that have 4E agreements uh, will also at some point in the future not be constrained by uh, state plans, but actually have the opportunity to develop their own programs and services. So I think there are kind of two tracks here and making sure that we're uh, paying attention to both of them um, is what will best serve Native families. Yeah. 
thank you, Sarah. So um, we're about to have to close, but before we do, what is your message to um, the audience, to jurisdictions uh, about Family First? What do you want to leave them with um, w w regarding challenges or successes? You know, uh, what message do you want to leave them? I'll start with you, David. Well, I guess I would say that the success of Family First um, isn't just dependent on the federal government, the Children's Bureau. It isn't just dependent on states. Um, it's dependent on everyone. Um, to make Family First, to truly achieve the vision of Family First, it's going to take um, uh, conversation and, um, and really hard work <laughs> by everyone, uh, by, by government, by providers, by affected communities, by advocates. Um, I think we've begun to see that, which is great. Um, I think we're going to need to see more of that, and I hope, I hope as we do that, we'll begin by trying to articulate shared goals. Um, I, I would love to think those goals are the kind of the transformational goals of Family First, um, keeping children safely at home, keeping families together, preventing maltreatment, reducing foster care. Um, but I think only if we kind of agree on the goals are we going to all be able to work together to truly achieve the vision of Family First, um, which I think is a very, very powerful one. Brian? I, I think that there's uh, still an opportunity um, at the federal level to bring some of the other players to the table that could be critical um, in the evolution um, of Family First. Specifically, you know, given um, its initial focus on families that struggle with mental health issues, behavioral health issues, um, and substance abuse, I think there's a real opportunity to bring Medicaid uh, and SAMHSA to the table to help all of us think more sophisticatedly about what interventions look like. So you go, you dig into SAMHSA's website, you see a ton in there um, about what the appropriate treatment for parents looks like around substance abuse. Um, you also can find um, their responses to how do you address the mental health needs of substance abusing parents, right? And so th there is a, a good deal of science um, backing the work that SAMHSA does around this population, but I don't know that it's been brought forward. And I don't know that it's been brought forward in a way that also brings Medicaid to the table to really be thinking about how do you grow a set of opportunities so that they're not limited to the SAMHSA space uh, and that there's a, more, a, a broader access to both the knowledge as well as intervention. So I really hope uh, that in the, in the uh, near future we can create that other table um, because I think in the end uh, it will be a great missed opportunity if we don't just create this prevention space, but also help states figure out how to do prevention for those families that are at the greatest risk um, of coming into the system. And so I think we've done a nice job of creating the anchor, clearly in the prevention space, getting to families before abuse and neglect occurs, getting to families before they need to in be involved with the child welfare system. So I think that's the right place to anchor. Uh, but I also think we've got to work backwards to those families that are experiencing more risk, uh, th those families for which uh, um, their, their response to treatment is less predictable, uh, and really also build the infrastructure and science around responding to those families too. Thanks, Brian. Um, CMS, SAMHSA, call me. <laughs> no, but seriously, um, uh, no, prevention, prevention, right, the, the, top, the top priority always. Um, Sarah, giving you the, the last word. Thank you. Uh, I just want to thank HHS leadership actually for this moment. I feel like so often when we're working on really uh, challenging situations, when we're uh, trying to figure out how best to serve kids and families, to wrap them with services and supports that allow kids to stay safely at home, um, then we're focused on those challenges and we don't always take the opportunity to celebrate, to celebrate the things that are going right. And so really appreciate uh, marking this anniversary, being really uh, public about it, inviting conversation uh, from jurisdictions uh, and hearing the voices of folks with lived experience uh, to really put our minds together to see what will best serve families and kids. So um, really good first steps, a lot more work to do as we've all acknowledged and uh, appreciate the comments about um, all of the folks that it will take uh, to keep making progress here, including, uh, very importantly, centering the experiences of kids and families. Thank you.
Thank you, Sarah, uh, Brian, David, for being here to celebrate Family First, but for your honesty about our the work ahead and the challenges moving forward, but also to celebrate our successes as well. We're going to take a five-minute break and then come back to the second panel that's going to be moderated by Commissioner Jones Gaston. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Rebecca Jones Gaston, Commissioner for ACYF and a proud team member with all of my ACF colleagues. It's good to see everyone. I um, have the pleasure of introducing uh, this wonderful esteemed panel and I'm gonna kind of cue up Vicki and hopefully she's online. Um, so Robert Matthews, Director for Child and Family Services Agency here in the District of Columbia. Robert's got a long tenure in, in child welfare uh, and human services and has served with Annie E. Casey, with the District of Columbia, obviously, with the Department of Human Services, then Human Resources, <laughs> and um, really is, is leading the way with the DC team with the, the first prevention plan that was submitted and approved um, for Family First. And then Justin Brown, Secretary of Oklahoma's Human Services, um, is, a pioneer in many ways of really, I think, embodying some of the things that we heard from the previous panel around really figuring out how do we all work together across organizations and communities and really leading, um, leading into a new way of doing this work and serving children and families. Thank you both for being here. And we have, good morning, Vicki. Good morning. We have Vicki Bradley, who is the Secretary for Public Health and Human Services of the Eastern Band of the Cherokee Indians. Uh, and Vicki has an esteemed uh, career in human services and public health and really, again, I think embodies the example that we've been talking about all morning around it's, it's not just a child welfare problem to solve. It really is um, the health of community, the health of families, the health of children. And so thank you for being here, Vicki. It's an honor, thank you. So, pathways to prevention, we heard that earlier this morning, and so I'm gonna kind of hold on to that as a, as a theme as we go into these questions. Um, and, and keep in mind, I have a favorite quote, so I get a little annoying with this because I put it on post-it notes everywhere I go. Uh, the most dangerous phrase in the language is we've always done it this way. And so what we have is an opportunity to really think about how do we need to do it differently and build towards that. And so we're gonna focus in on behavioral health. So I'm, Robert, I'm gonna start with you. Communities and families across the country are struggling and experiencing significant behavioral health challenges. How has the Family First, how has Family First changed the way you serve children and families in your community? Well, first, thank you for inviting me, and I'm glad to be here and speak with everyone. Uh, before, we, before I talk about specific services that may help to um, assist families with mental health and behavioral health issues, um, I gotta talk about, before you even get there, um, you have to encourage families to participate. You have to encourage families to know that um, if by chance they participate in services, they can get to what we call some level of success and everyone defines that differently. So one thing that uh, here in the District of Columbia that we thought about very early on was around motivational interviewing. We understood the relationship between uh, the family and that case manager, that if that case manager could not convince or encourage the family to participate, no matter if you have a litany of services and programs, you're not really gonna find success. So what we attempted to do was to train all of our social workers, both in our public child welfare agency as well as our case managers in, with our community partners around motivational interviewing. And it gave our workforce a different tool. We already knew that we have licensed social workers, but 
when you try to give them tools to better engage families to participate, that's a different set of skills that you probably didn't get when you were in college. And so what motivational interviewing does, it allows you to really meet the families where they are. And the importance of that is the language. Um, you probably, if you're a licensed social worker in LICSW, you use a lot of clinical language. Well, how many families may understand what you mean? So if you sit down with the mother and the father and really meet them where they are to understand their set of circumstances and to say, listen, we don't want to take your kid away. We don't want to separate your kid. We don't want to uh, tear your family apart, which is what child welfare is known to do. But if, you, if I can work with you around participating in services, I can't promise. And here's the other part about if we're talking about substance use. We can't necessarily promise that a mother or father, because of their history of addiction, will just end it cold turkey. If that is the goal, we, we have a high bar to set, and we're not going to meet it. But we have to define success in a different way. We have to define success where it makes sense to the family. So if that means to where they may have used every day, how can we gradually say, how can we gradually go from seven to six, six to five, five to four? And that may be successful for that family, but as you reduce the amount of use, what you may find is that's the very thing that prevents that child from coming into foster care. Justin? Well, that was uh, very well put. Thank you for that. Um, thank you also for the honor to be here. It's, uh, it's just fantastic to be such uh, connected partners with our federal, uh, federal agencies. Um, the thing that I think about that uh, Family First has done for us in the state of Oklahoma has allowed for us to really build this level of what I call organizational intimacy. And so the idea is, and you know, honestly, I will admit that we did not come from a place of organizational intimacy. Uh, government isn't great necessarily at working across silos, uh, not just within government, with other agencies, but with outside partners in the community that are so important to serving uh, those that we do serve. So this concept of organizational intimacy begins with a common vision and common language. And um, we as an agency have begun to build a family building system instead of necessarily a foster care system. The idea is a family building system. And so Family First allowed for us to come together as systems to, to uh, have this common vision and language for prevention uh, in our communities. And so really, honestly, the stage, stage that we sit in, that landscape has been critically important as a culture that we share across systems that are so important. And um, one of the things that has also been really important is as we build those partners across the state, it has created for us a, a sort of a delivery network that allows for us to know that we have partners aligned in culture and mission uh, so that when we identify a gap for a family and the services that we operate and that we offer, we can we know that we have partners in the community there to stand up to fill that gap. So for me, uh, Family First at this stage for us has been so powerful in giving us that opportunity to share mission and to build culture with partners uh, with whom we have not necessarily been always that well uh, connected. Thank you. Vicki? Kia ona God. Hello, everyone. First of all, thank you for inviting me. I'm honored to be able to participate today. So being a direct funded tribal 4E tribe here in uh, Western North Carolina, the Eastern Man of Cherokee Indians, and having being a recipient of the Family First funding, it has not necessarily changed the way we do business, but it helps us access resources and have greater flexibility with the way we do business and serve families. So we know that providing services and an intersect with those families that may or may not have initially um, presented in our system, in the child welfare system, is crucial. We need to reach those families that are beginning to have problems in the Family First Act helps us to be able to do that, helps us to provide and access resources to provide more therapeutic modalities and specialized services to those families in the community that are really Cherokee-centric and that we know work for our community here, uh, which is critical. It's a critical path for success in keeping those children with their, with their moms, dads, or the kinships that they have. Thank you. So substance use has been a challenge for a long time and continues to be. 
Uh, where do you see the opportunities to, to build in the spirit of family first, in the spirit of prevention and preservation, to, to build towards services and programs specifically focused on substance use connected to how do we keep children out of foster care and together with their families? Justin. Thank you very much. Um, so for us in Oklahoma, of course, we suffer with um, extremely high levels of poverty and substance use disorder. And um, the opportunity for us really comes from those partners that are through those partners that I've spoke about earlier. Um, this ability to work together to understand the needs of those that we serve, um, specifically around substance use. And then as we see where we do operate and where we do serve well and what the real needs of families are, um, and where we need to provide those needs, we also are able to look in the white space, the space in which we don't have services, the gaps in services that, uh, that exist. And so uh, as we do that, we've been able to um, do things like use transition funding from Family First to talk about or to bring um, services into Oklahoma that we has, had historically been, um, had been service gaps for us, specifically around uh, substance use in, in families and with parents who have very young children. Uh, that's been and, and consistent case management for those families. So it's a, a program that we've built and uh, that we're sort of building up now also uh, to be evaluated through the clearinghouse. So uh, it's been, a, again, that, that landscape of relationships is really important for us in Oklahoma as we understand the gaps that exist so that we can bring substance use programs um, and case management to, to, our, to those we serve. Thank you. Vicki, uh, your lens with public health um, probably uh, lends some really um, special insight into this. Would you share from your perspective? Absolutely. Here in Cherokee, we've created an, an integrated model with our child welfare system and behavioral health. And to have true fidelity to that model, we need access to resources that address all of those social determinants of health. We know that poverty, housing, transportation, all of that affects the way that families live, work, learn, play, and substance use is a great contributor in them not being able to access those resources, right? And so in order to get true fidelity to our model here, we need access to providers that will treat the whole family. We don't need a provider that addresses services for just the child and then someone else is treating the parent and someone else is treating a sibling. And so the funding helps us in our uh, Project Gadugi here is the name of our program to be able to use providers and to access those providers that can provide services to the whole family that take them into the community, into the field and reach the family. And so I appreciate you mentioning public health. It is a passion, but it, it's all, and the reason we chose to create an integrated model is because we can't treat our families in silos. That's not the way native families do in our community. Um, our families are often made up of, of various support systems. And so when we want to access services for, for prevention or intervention, has to be therapeutic in a way that the whole family is targeted by a provider that's willing to deal with all the issues in the family. So co-locating behavioral health providers and medical providers, substance abuse counselors, professional counselors, uh, helping collaborate with other programs in our community like medication assisted therapy clinics, uh, outpatient clinics, inpatient services, all of those things create one uh, huge support system, which is what we're after. Thank you, Robert. So um, in Washington, D.C., we have invested in an evidence-based program called Project Connect. And within that particular program, it has um, a parent educator, it has a clinical uh, case manager, and it has a nurse as well. Now, that's important because what we found is many of our parents who have substance use issues, they have younger children. And what that nurse can provide are some very concrete um, supports for that mother and or father, um, separate and apart from them um, receiving any substance use um, 
treatment. Here's the important part too in, in the case management because it is intensive. And again, I spoke previously about how to define success. Um, there is a huge intersex intersection uh, with um, families that have substance use issues that brought them to the attention of our child welfare agency. Uh, but we have also found where we're not only the ones serving that family, they're also receiving public benefits. And then they also have um, things that they must adhere to for public benefits. So the importance of there needs to be centrally someone thinking about how realistic is it that I can intensively work with this parent on their substance use issue. They have to continue to meet other demands from an entirely different agency to ensure they can uh, receive their public benefits to ensure they provide all of the concrete needs for their children. And so really it gets down to prioritization. What's most important? Because realistically, put yourself in the shoes of their parent. How many of us could do all of the things that government asks us to do day in and day out? Having someone in your home three to four times a week, and I have to make sure my kids are at school, I have to make sure that I get them to the doctor's office, things of that nature. The routine things that we oftentimes take for granted, that we don't think the stressors that we put on parents and the need for us to think differently of how we work with them. So the program has allowed us to think about what's a universal way to think about how can you realistically do this before we get to that so that the child doesn't have to come into foster care. So what I'm hearing is paying attention to those social determinants of health and moving away from what in child welfare we've historically kind of compartmentalized. We've got a child and we've got a family and we've got a community and actually realizing that they all have connections and belong, belong together. So as you all know, we've got significant disparities that are happening across communities um, and exist with children, youth, and families. And those, dis those disparities get built upon um, as families and children are um, involved with the child welfare system. So how are you approaching uh, increasing culturally relevant, culturally specific um, services in your community to help keep families together? And Vicki, I'm gonna start with you. Thank you. So our program for family prevention is called Project Gadugi, and Gadugi in Cherokee means community. So it is a culturally based, community-oriented effort to help vulnerable families protect the children that they love through building connections with other programs in the communities. Mm -hmm. I want to emphasize community here because Cherokee values are what our program is predicated upon. Those values are part of the design of the project. Um, we allow the community to help us do what was traditionally accepted. We say, um, if you know one tribe, you know one tribe, right? Sarah mentioned allowing the tribes the flexibility to design a system that is centric, if you will, to their tribe. And I think that is really important in the design of your, of your family prevention projects is because we know what Cherokee values are and we know what must be incorporated in our program in order to be successful. So we use, um, a lot of different modalities. Language been one of the primary um, support systems and ways that we communicate with our families. So we call it taking care of our own. We know how to take care of our own. We just have to have resources and tools to do that. So they're not always explicit and blatant to those coming into our systems to recognize and realize what components have to be a part of our systems, but our teams know that and our families know that. And so incorporating the use of those, those values to accomplish our vision, which is seven generations of wellness in mind, body, and spirit uh, is absolutely a necessity in being successful. Thank you, Robert. So we have incorporated what we call diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. And actually, we have a great partnership with the Center for States for the past two years that have helped set the foundation for what that looks like um, in our agency, both internally and externally with our partners. 
And in that, before we can even have a discussion around, as we know in the data, it shows that more black and brown kids are disproportionately represented in the foster care population. You have to ground yourself in a shared language and understanding. What we recognized very early on, we wanted to use words like disproportionality, disparity, implicit bias. Nobody knew what that meant. <laughs> We were throwing around words we had no idea what it meant, and so what we realized is that we had to first um, raise the awareness and educate our workers on what that means. And when we look at the data, which has been the same for many years, is that we remove more black and brown kids. The question is why? And how does that align up with the data? How does that align up with how we make policy and practice decisions? And, and when you look at it, and then people are like, well, wait a minute, most of your workforce are people of color. That tells you a whole different story, right? Um, it talks about, do you bring your bias to the table in making decisions on the front end to decide whether a child comes into foster care or not, even when that child looks like you? And so it really begins to allow workers to have a self-reflection to think about, wow, is that something we can do, an effort that we can make before bringing that child into foster care that we never thought about before, or we did, or we was thinking, oh, guess what? It's the easiest thing to do. We know how to remove kids. The question is, is that the right thing to do? Could we actually use more of our efforts to really try to stabilize that family to provide in-home services, a lot of the services that Family First actually allow us to do? That's what this really is all about. How can we service families more upstream, identify them early, work with them? But guess what? What we found out, that actually takes more work. And so it always goes back to your values. Do you value in keeping families together? And if you do, that means you're going to make all the concerted efforts to try to do that. Wow, such powerful comments um, in the last two here. Um, one of the things that resonates to me was seven generations of wellness. That's incredible to think about. And then, of course, following data around disparities is something uh, that we have leaned into deeply in the state of Oklahoma, as well as building internal structures and intentional structures to listen to our communities, to listen to our workforce that is disproportionately made up of women and women of color, which is an incredible um, opportunity for us, but one that we have not taken advantage of over the generations in our agency. And so those intentional structures internally are really important. Uh, when I think about um, disproportionality I, we, and, and working uh, to be culturally aware, we think a lot about our tribal partners, of course, in Oklahoma with uh, 39 federally recognized tribes within our state. We work really closely um, in the operations of government, uh, specifically in human services with our tribal partners. And it's a, an incredible uh, luxury to have those, those relationships there to do so. It, in fact, during the, and it's always top of mind for us. So during the creation of our Family First Plan, we, we worked with the Oklahoma Indian Child Welfare Association uh, to really craft that plan together. So we started with the foundation of collaboration with our tribal partners. Um, secondly, or, and just sort of throughout, as we look at the programs that we're bringing in and our tribal partners utilize, um, we compare those and we look at how those programs uh, that our tribal partners utilize, how they differ from ours and how can we embrace those programs within our agency. Uh, one, of course, to provide those services to the kids and families who need them, but also to illustrate to our own internal workforce that it is a part of our culture to collaborate uh, to, with, our, with our tribes. Um, and so that's been really important for us. Of course, we also work with, uh, we have a, a professor resource or a, a, an academic resource that we work with to, to really intentionally think about our programs as well uh, through that lens of, uh, of sort of cultural adaptation. So um, lots of intentional structures um, in a system that honestly has not been all that intentional about it to begin with. So um, it's a part of who we are now and I'm thankful for that and our team has leaned into it. Thank you. So over the last couple of years, there have been really unprecedented investments from the federal government into behavioral health um, through HHS, through Family First, through other, other entities across the government. Can you talk a little bit about how those partnerships um, and federal resources have been helpful uh, <laughs> as you've been focusing on some of the behavioral health needs of the community you're serving? Sure, I can talk about one that's been very helpful and that I think um, was spoken to by the, the prior panel, um, holonicity. Um, now my agency, um, being a child welfare agency, uh, we don't fund it, but we work with our departments of health who do fund it through McPhee. 
um, in providing home visiting services for many of our, our families. Um, it's important because what I'm talking about is the need for collaboration and partnership. Um, understanding that my agency has a role, um, but we may not have what we call all of the supports and services under my umbrella that may also provide supports to those families. And the importance of home visiting is critical because what you may find is that there could be a family um, that's been subjected to a CPS investigation um, to where it's not necessarily an open case, it's an open investigation. I know that's technical, but that's what it is. Um, but that home visitor, um, let's just say we close out our investigation, that home visitor continues to be in the home. They're considered a mandated reporter probably in some jurisdictions. And so this is another level of prevention to where there's someone in the home working with the mom and mom or dad, um, ensuring that this child, you know, is doing well developmentally, is growing, is healthy, um, has all of his or her basic needs met. And guess what? Child welfare is nowhere in the, in the picture. That's true partnership, but it's also utilizing a different service and supports or programs for families to where, no, they don't have to come to our attention. We can work with our departments of health because believe me, if there is concern, they're going to call the hotline or central intake to where we do. So I think that's an example of how the public child welfare agency and another agency that may oversee home visiting can partner to ensure uh, families uh, stay intact. Yeah, I think um, that concept of partnership and alignment of, of systems is really important. Of course, I've said that a number of times here. I've referred to uh, one specific program that sort of spun out of some regional partnership grants uh, that was a um, all about um, uh, t doing uh, helping with substance abuse services for parents with very young children. So I've mentioned that in prior comments. Um, but it, it, that's an alignment. It's a sort of came from multi-agency alignment um, that you know utilized lots of different funding streams, not just uh, the funding streams that we've talked about here today. Um, the, what we really talk about, of course, is the whole family, the whole person, the work that we're trying to do to to meet their needs earlier and meet them um, sort of in their crisis or in their situation before it turns into crisis. And things like family or home visitation is super important in setting eyes on families and under, let, helping them understand that um, that there are resources that exist um, that that um, you know multiple agencies come together and provide um, in unison. Vicki? Sure, I, I agree with what's already been spoken. We have, we are a recipient of McVie funding here, and so we do have a nurse family partnership program that uh, is really useful in that, that early life intervention stage. But we also have some other federal programs that create great partnerships and resources for families. When you talk about prevention and accessing uh, those areas of need in social determinants like food, transportation, housing. Um, the FDPIR, the Food Distribution Program on Indian Reservations we have in our community, it's a great resource for families and provides connectivity to other um, social networks like cooking classes and things to help habilitate families that may not have had the experience in learning how to use the foods that they are recipients of. We also have a CDC collaborative on opioid response grant. And so a lot of the activities in that, uh, in those deliverables are very helpful and effective in creating resources for our families. Probably our greatest intersect here is with our hospital, Cherokee Union Hospital Authority, which houses all of our behavioral health component. And this project has allowed us to co-locate uh, and I've mentioned fidelity to the integrated model numerous times because it is the pinnacle of success for us is to have true fidelity to this full integration. And so co-locating the behavioral health specialists and providers in the same space with our social workers and other team members from what we call our family safety program has made a huge difference. It is, uh, we've created a paradigm here somewhat shift from, oh no, there comes uh, social services, which we call our program family safety, because we want people to believe that our goal is to keep them safe. Instead of, oh no, they're coming to take my children, it's, oh, thank goodness, here they are. They're going to help me keep my children. And so those partnerships really make a difference in that. That's such an important point of shifting, shifting really the, um, 
reputation, the perception, the reality that child welfare agencies have oftentimes been met with of like, we don't want to do, we don't want to have anything to do with you, but really in a spirit of partnership, how are we actually engaged together so that, you know, I think from the child welfare end, we would love to not actually see families. Um, and, and that means we've got to be um, partners with those that are serving families long before um, a concern arises. And so uh, implementation, we've heard earlier, you know, folks are in all sorts of different stages of implementation with Family First. What's one piece of advice that you would give to jurisdictions, to states, to tribes, as they are uh, seeking to serve uh, children and families in their communities, kind of in the focus around behavioral health? Um, yes, yeah, so uh, I've told our team for years now that you, we can't expect both excellence in the work that we do, which we require on a daily basis, and the same teams to transform um, at, at, every, at every point as well. And make no mistake, moving upstream and being preven preventative is a transformation in these systems. And so um, my recommendation or my piece of advice would be that structures have to be built to support that transformation, internal structures, external structures. It can't be um, just a vision and a culture change and then we're gonna go do it. We have to support teams to be excellent and innovate. And as those structures build, um, you, in my, my recommendation is to sort of start slowly, um, to do, make incremental um, change to lean in, uh, lean in culturally, but, but the slow approach, methodical approach is required so that you can build those structures to support real long-term transformation. Mm -hmm. Vicki? <laughs> I think Justin took my words. You saw my notes, didn't you? <laughs> that was exactly what I was going to say, is be very strategic. Be very strategic, and that is pre-planning and planning your programs, but be aware of your infrastructure and your workforce and what you can deliver and don't over try to over deliver. Phase your projects in, pray, uh, phase your innovations in, take it uh, small steps at a time because I think it's really important that it has to be data driven. And if you're not measuring your results as you go and your outcomes, you never know if you're effective. And so whatever your design is, do it incrementally so that you can measure as you go to see if it's effective or if you need to step back and regroup and change some things in order to be the best that you can be. Robert? If I was in church, I'd say amen. <laughs> Listen, everything that, that my colleagues just said is true. Uh, this is what I would leave you with. Um, for jurisdictions that are still in the, in the phase of implementation, we're all in different phases of that. Um, I always want you to start with what environmental scan have you conducted? That's important because that scan will tell you what the need is. But what I've heard from some, and I've heard from some for the past couple of years, uh, talk about, we want this service, we want this service, we want this service, we want this service. It's really not about having a menu of services because those menu of services that you may see on the clearinghouse may not even be the ones that are needed in your jurisdiction. So then that makes your whole plan not aligned to the need that's on the ground. So it starts with ensuring that you do a robust environmental scan of what your needs are and guess what, depending on the size, let's say it's two, then it's gonna be two. But what you can at least ensure is that it will be utilized and that your investment will go very far. You can have as many services as you would like to have, but then to my colleague's point, you may not even have the infrastructure. So then you put it in your plan and then you press go and then there's this year delay because you didn't build infrastructure. So you gotta think about these things very gradually. That, this is not the first one that reaches the top is the winner. That's not how this should go. This should go as if you gradually do it, build along the way, create the type of partnerships that you need to accomplish it, then I think you'll, you'll be successful. So I feel like the three of you are um, trying to tell me something because 
I tend to be one that's like, let's get it done now. Um, <laughs> um, but with with the the sense of urgency of really taking advantage of the of the sea change that's happening, right? It is it is important to think really intentionally and strategically about um, what we're doing, how we're doing, who we're doing it with, and um, and build from there. So in just the last couple of minutes, briefly, if there was one one thought that you wanted to leave uh, everybody here or the folks that are on with us virtually with in regards to um, possibilities, um, what would that be? That although the Child Welfare Agency was set up to separate families, you can be the very agency to keep families together. Um, yeah, so w what I'm sitting here thinking is that there are lots of um, narratives in the community that in, and in different communities and in leadership that are somewhat counter sometimes to the work that we think and we know is important. And so I think the possibilities are that if we follow the data, we create the outcomes that we're trying to achieve first, uh, we can bring those people along because this is the work that is right. We're, we're doing what's right. It's right by families. It's right by people. But it's also right by systems and government and workforce. And so uh, the intentionality that we've talked about in building structures also allows us to identify outcomes that we're trying to achieve that will bring people along to join us in the, wor the work. It might take some time, uh, but that's the possibility that exists. Vicki, close love this out. You serve. If you love the community that you serve and you believe in them, believe that they are capable of change, um, it will always lend support on those hard days when you feel like you're not making a difference. You remember what you're there for and that your community is full of strengths and fully capable of changing and so are families. Every family has strengths. Thank you, I like that. If you love the community you're serving. Um, so I, I wanna take a moment and just think uh, Director Matthews, Secretary Brown, and Secretary Bradley for uh, joining me today on this panel. I do want to give a little bit of a shout out to our uh, colleagues from Virginia who made the trek over the bridge <laughs> <laughs> to join us as well. Commissioner Avula and Deputy Commissioner Ayers, thank you for being here and thank you for everyone. And I'm going to hand it back over to Assistant Secretary Contreras now. on to the people who are behind this movement. So as Senator Wyden said, you know, he thinks his job was the easy one in terms of bipartisan members of Congress coming together to pass this law. I don't know that that's as easy as it sounds, but I will say as I look in the audience, I see people from the Children's Bureau who have been working on this issue for the last five years and in, with a lot of intent in the last several months just since I've been here. I see our state leaders, our tribal leaders um, who are being innovative and who are leading with heart and hope um, as, we, as we hope exists, but we can see it with our own eyes. Um, and so I just wanna thank everyone again. As we started this out, we said, none of this happens alone. We only accomplish this by working together. Um, I again just want to bring us back to Ashanti and Jeff um, because that's who we're thinking about. That's who we're thinking about when we go to bed at night and we're worried about the responsibility that we care. But it's also how we wake up in the morning, hopefully with our hearts full of hope about what we can do that very day to support them in their journeys and keep them with their kids. So I wanna thank all of our panelists. Um, I also wanna thank Commissioner Avula for being here from Virginia. And thank everyone again in this room and virtually, we're so grateful to be in this community together. We know that the state of our nation depends on the state of our families. And I think you heard from everyone in this stage that they know that too. So thank you so much for being with us. Thanks to our HHS and our ACF families for making this event happen. 
Um, and we look forward to continuing this dialogue and seeing what it is we have to celebrate in five years from now. Thanks so much. Produced by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services.